Welcome to the Beyond Barriers podcast. If you're an ambitious woman who wants to advance in leadership, then this podcast is for you. This podcast is co-hosted by Nikki Barua, digital innovator, serial entrepreneur, author, and speaker, and Monique Marquez, senior corporate leader, ex-Googler, and diversity expert. From inspiring stories to cutting edge strategies, you'll learn how to develop the skill set, mindset, and tool set to get future ready fast and accelerate your success. Hi, I'm Monica, your host for today's episode. Wendy Berger is a serial entrepreneur. For reasons she can't even explain herself, Wendy grew up wanting to be president of a bank. Her journey has led her down the path where she finds herself today as CEO and founder of WBS Equities, LLC. Wendy used to always focus on the end result, but now she enjoys the journey. She learned this in part from the traumatic losses of her brother and then her husband three years later. Mary didn't allow the tragedy of their deaths to go in vain. Instead, she learned and developed the strength and tools for the successes she acquired to date. In this episode, Wendy also shares with us her ideas around big thinking and the courage it takes to make significant moves in life and business. She's a curious businesswoman who now focuses on real estate and the cannabis industry, for which she serves on an executive board. And if that isn't impressive enough, she's an avid athlete who has completed 38 triathlons. Take a few minutes to tune in and learn the tips and tools Wendy regularly shares with her mini mentees. Visit IamBeyondBarriers.com where you'll find show notes and links to all the resources in this episode, including the best way to get in touch with Wendy. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you so much for joining us on the Beyond Barriers podcast. We are thrilled to have you here. Uh, We know that our guests are going to be interested in learning all about your journey and a little bit about your story and what you've learned along the way and any lessons that you want to share as to, you know, when you think about Wendy, when you first started off and Wendy today, um, what got you into the role right now where you are, you know, CEO, founder of WBS Equities? Uh, It's a pleasure to be with you here today. Thanks so much for having me. And it's such a privilege to be able to share my story with your listeners and to listen to your other storytellers that continues to inspire me. So delighted to be with you. Amazing. Uh, God, my story that, you know, (laughs) we, we, I think so many of us, particularly, I am a serial entrepreneur to my very core. I mean, I remember being at a very young age um, where most people think about being astronauts or the president of the United States. (laughs) I wanted to be the president of a bank. I I can't tell you where (laughs) this came from or why, but that's, you know, I, my early thinking was incredibly focused. And I really, as I look back and think about how I ended up where I am today, I didn't think about the journey. I only was focused on the end goal. And as Mm. I reflect back, I missed how important and interesting and fun the journey can be. So today I think so much more about the journey and that the journey is my value, right? That, that mm. the value is in the journey. So how I got here is, you know, a, a, a strange set of circumstances, but I did not think that, I don't think I saw myself as a serial entrepreneur. I thought mm-hmm. I would, First job in life and my second job, and that would be it because that was mm-hmm. kind of you go get some training somewhere and then you end up where you're supposed to be or wherever that goal is instead right. of learning about myself and, and thinking about enjoying the path and, and mm. continuously growing and changing, right? I, mm-hmm. I think so many of us fear change. Mm-hmm. Um, but today, uh, I, I, I'm so happy and I feel so grateful with where I am. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called WBS Equities. We specialize in ground-up construction, renovation, and sale leasebacks. 
of mm-hmm. food manufacturing and food distribution facilities. So I jokingly say that I hold up a sign on the side of the highway that says, <laughs> we'll do real estate for food. Uh, <laughs> way to understand that we do industrial real estate for food manufacturing companies. Mm-hmm. And the other side of my business life is I am on the board of directors of a publicly traded marijuana company, Green Thumb mm. Industries. We're uh, among the largest companies in the United States with operations in 17 states, well over 4,000 employees, and close to a billion dollars in revenues, which I sit here and kind of giggle that I am now. I, I always wanted to be on the board of a publicly traded company. I right. think it would be in a federally illegal business. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm one of the very few women on the boards of publicly traded cannabis companies. Mm-hmm. We started growing in this business, and when we became a publicly traded company, I was the only woman Mm. outside uh, outside director. And in the first year, I was one of only two women. Mm, Wow! Wow! um, We're advancing, but still have a long way to go. So that's where I am today. A little bit about what phenomenal. I love that story, and I love like you were saying. I, I love what I hear out of there. There was a level of curiosity. And, you know, you didn't have that straight traditional kind of uh, career path. And like you said, I think you embrace the idea of curiosity. And I think you that hunger that you had, too, for some, you know, for whether it was variety or you wanting to be kind of the president of your bank. And can you talk a little bit about the uncertainty? Like, how did you step into that uncertainty? Because I know a lot of the times for women, especially going into industries, where there are few women or not a lot of role models like ourselves that we see. Um, And then going into an industry where, where, you know, switching industries in some cases, like you worked for a corporation, then you went off on, you've gone off on your own. How do you step into that certainty? Do you have fear and self-doubt? And when you do, how do you keep pushing forward? Oh my God. I'm going to say I used to have fear and self-doubt. Uh-huh. And I think today I almost have no fears, but Mm. that came only through really deeply personal and, and painful experiences, which I, I don't spend a lot of time in the rear view mirror looking backwards, Mm -hmm. but I am very conscious though, that until I began to let go of fears that Mm -hmm. were holding me back, um, I wasn't living a full life and I wasn't doing those, all of the things that I want to do. And frankly, I didn't let myself dream of those things because Mm -hmm. of fear. Mm -hmm. And now I think a lot about big thinking. And I know it sounds strange Mm -hmm. to say thinking about big thinking, but a little bit like yoga, it takes practice. It takes retraining our minds to be courageous enough to let go of our fears and to let go of those things that hold us back. Mm. And one of the ways I started to think about it was to realize that I was defining myself by my past and by those expectations that Mm -hmm. I had. And it wasn't until I started to say that the things that happened to me previously did not have to define the person that I want to be and this person that I continue to strive to be. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that it was two very personal experiences that I'll share a little bit about with you Mm -hmm. today that really helped me. And um, in the span of less than four years. Um, My beloved brother was killed in a plane crash. Mm. And three years later, my husband of 24 years committed suicide. Wow. And um, I was broken. I was completely broken and shattered. And I had no idea. Well, first of all, I didn't for the first after my brother was killed. I really didn't want to live Mm -hmm. at some point because of who I am um, and 
how I see the world. My sister and I in particular looked at each other and said, we are going to try to find a way to live joyful lives, live meaningful lives and live purposeful lives. And as I started to crawl again, walk again, learn how to breathe Mm -hmm. again, um, I began to really realize that my fears were holding me back in every Mm. way. And it wasn't until I began to shed those fears. And there was a real pivotal moment for me a few years ago. I was invited to attend a GE leadership training conference. And it was fascinating. Mm -hmm. It was at GE's old training center in Crotonville, New York. (laughs) Camp GE. And the leadership of GE decided to put on a conference, not for their top women in the organization, but their top rising women. Mm. So it was 80 women from around the world within GE. They're identified as the top rising women and some business partners. And we were invited to spend three days at Crotonville. And the introduction to the program was given by then CEO Jeff Immelt. Um, And Mm -hmm. so that sort of told me the importance they were placing on this was that Jeff Immelt and the CFO and a few of the other senior leaders came to this conference to speak to us. And Mm -hmm. Jeff Immelt could not have known that this was just five months short of the second tragedy in my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was there and I was shaking and I was still really feeling very fragile And it was still hard to kind of be in a crowd, and I was still trying to figure out life, frankly. Mm -hmm. And Jeff Melt is walking around, and he comes right up to me in my face. And he looks at me, and he says, what would you do if you had no fear? And in that moment, I looked at him without thinking, and I said, I don't have any. Wow. And, And it was as though... At that moment, I actually believed it because that is what had happened to me in those intervening months. Mm -hmm. Without consciousness, but this desire to live, I had shed all of my fears, you know, except for personal safety. We still Mm -hmm. like, as as women, Uh have to be very conscious of that. But those things that held me back by thinking that I was defined. by the expectations, my own or others in the past, mm-hmm. were gone. Wow. And, and that started me on this path of thinking about big thinking. And then I came mm-hmm. up with this mantra that I've latched onto, which is that big thinking precedes great accomplishments. Wow. Wow. I love that. And the idea around big thinking to me is it helps you. It's a level of self-introspection, just reflection uh, and setting kind of this compelling vision. Um, You know, when I think about, you know, you're thinking big thinking. um, Can you tell me a little bit about like, what is this ritual that you do when you're when you call it big thinking? How do you give yourself the space to do that? So because I'm a real estate developer at heart, uh-huh. uh, I somehow this notion in my mind came to me of a tool belt, right? I build things mm-hmm. that make sense. So I thought about tools in my tool belt. And what I learned from coming back from grief was that, first of all, we don't get over grief. We learn mm-hmm. how to carry it with us. Right. And... What I learned was that when you are grieving, there isn't one go-to all of the time, that that Mm -hmm. there were days that yoga worked, and there were days that not getting out of bed worked, and there were days that going out Mm -hmm. and consuming alcohol worked, and uh, but that clearly no one thing worked all the time. So I came up with this Mm -hmm. idea of tools in my tool belt, different ideas to draw from that would help me give myself the space to think big. And it was things like knowing my own story, right? We, mm. we all have different stories that we tell about ourselves. 
And whether we always believe everything about those stories in different situations, we tell different stories. And, and I needed to be telling better, bolder, more courageous stories because I was courageous. Mm. And I started to look at the, the way I had been living my life in what I now called my old life be, as opposed to my new life was that I needed to tell the story of this strong woman who was resilient and mm. courageous and yes. curious. And so I, I thought about listening more, right? As I'm thinking about telling my own story, the key to telling my own story was really listening, asking questions. And when I was done asking questions, ask more questions. Mm -hmm. And when I started asking questions and listening to people, I learned so many amazing things about people. People share their own stories with you and you begin to find connections where you did not know those connections were. So right. listening was a big one. Expressing gratitude um, to the people you work with, to your friends, to the cashier at the grocery store, mm -hmm. uh, to ourselves. And to reiterate, for me, it was reiterating the concept to myself that this courageousness and this curiosity had a foundation in gratitude, which may not mm -hmm. seem obvious, but it felt that way to me. Practicing empathy was another tool in my tool belt, right? Things mm, made right. me feel po powerful and strong. Practicing empathy, first of all, empathy is contagious. It disarms people and it helps people become more expressive. So if we think about being successful in business, listening, right? If we want to be good mm -hmm. negotiators, then be good leaders. Listening is so key to that and practice yes. empathy, right? If you want to lead a team of people, I want to be an empathetic leader, right? I right. want to be a leader that people want to work with and people want to say, I believe in her, and mm -hmm. I want to follow her and I want to accept her leadership and I want to grow and learn. Um, other tools in my tool belt were things like uh, saying yes. Super simple, but for so many of us, again, tight. Right. Yes to new experiences. Yes to challenging myself. Yes to confronting the things that scare me. Mm. Yes to pushing my own boundaries and yes to standing up for myself. Right. And then Powerful. maybe most importantly, asking for help, right? I, I think oh, so yes. many of us, I, I can tell you that for sure in my first job, which was at a bank, I worked at a middle market bank in Chicago. Basically, I was a widget lender and mm -hmm. I was one of very few women in, the, in that environment. Mm -hmm. And I really was bound and determined never to let anyone see any sign of right. yes. So I went home and cried. That was one thing, but there was no chance that I was going to portray myself as anything but a strong and independent woman. And I thought I could do everything for myself and that I had to. Um, and then after the two deaths of these important people in my life, I had no choice but to ask for help. I was literally mm. broken. And that was a moment in which I thought, I don't have a choice. Like, uh, it's not whether I want to be seen as strong and independent. I mm -hmm. have to ask for people for help. Right. And that's, that's extremely, extremely important. What if you could pinpoint the invisible ceilings limiting your success? Imagine having clarity on your strengths and barriers so you can take action and gain unstoppable momentum to advance as a future ready leader. Well, that's exactly what the Beyond Barriers quiz will help you discover. You'll get your personalized score based on the 25 essential elements proven to accelerate success in the digital age so you can understand what's holding you back and where to focus your efforts. The Beyond Barriers quiz is completely free and takes just a few minutes. Go to imbeyondbarriers.com slash quiz and take the quiz today. 
So one of the things that we really focus on in here at Beyond Barriers and, um, you know, with the individuals that we coach through our program is that idea of leveraging community and asking for help. Um, Because I believe, you know, research has indicated, and I personally believe that we don't leverage our community um, to the full extent, to the full potential that's there. Because like you said, there are some ego pride fears that if you ask for help, then you're less than or that you can't do it on your own and those types of things. Um, Can you talk a little bit about what helped you? Like you said, you got to a point where you knew you had to ask for help, but how did you ask for help? Like what were, you know, who did you leverage? How did you build those relationships? You know, what gave you, you know, what were the actual like words that you said, hey, I need help? Um, in, a, in a way that didn't make you feel like you were less than? The first few times I still did feel that I was less than. Mm. But as I realized that the way people responded when I did ask for help was actually positive. So I, I'll tell you one of the first things that I had to do after my husband died, and this was three weeks after he died, I had Mm. to make a decision whether to go on a business trip. And I was going to hopefully close what was going to be one of the biggest deals of my career to Mm. build a very significant food processing plant for a really large company. And I decided to go. Mm -hmm. And I am in a CEO's office and I'm sitting in his office. And this is a large presence of a man, uh-huh. not physically intimidating, but it, an ultra successful, very polished, elegant, brilliant gentleman. And I'm with his CFO, his general counsel, and a couple of other members of their senior legal team. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting in this man's conference room in Irvine, California, you know, spectacular view, looking over all of uh, uh, Southern California, of Orange County, and trying to convince them that three weeks after a tragedy, they should award this giant project to me that was critical for the future of their company. Mm-hmm. And he said to me, are you sure you can do this? Like, how can you, and he was very direct. Can you assure to us that given what's just happened in your life, you're not going to fall apart? He didn't use those words, but. Right, right. And I looked at him and I said to him, I can assure you that I will be 100% of the time when I am focused on this project, I will be focused, which didn't mean 100% of the time I'm going to be focused on it, but when Mm -hmm. I I will. And I said to him, I am going to add to my team of people specifically for this project. And he looked at me and said, no, I'm asking you, I'm hiring you. Mm -hmm. And I back to him, I'm still a great leader none of that has changed, right? You Mm. you have brought me to this point because you believe in my vision and my leadership. But yes, I'm going to supplement my team because I recognize that while I think I'm fine, I'm not fine, right? And it's going to take me time. And he looked at me and he said, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I got the project. Wow. It's a a radical candor is so powerful. Transparency is so powerful. And they could see me shaking, right? I mean, this is three weeks after and I am a me, but I didn't really know what I was going to be able to do. But I did convince him that my leadership was Mm -hmm. what he was hiring for me for. Not my hundred percent on the job every second, but my leadership and my ability to assemble a great team and to lead that team. That's so powerful. And I think that authenticity that you brought to that conversation and that radical candor um, (laughs) is extremely powerful. And, you know, and what I also want to share in, in, and you can help answer that question was, 
you did a little bit of self-promotion in that piece where you didn't back down. You said, you, you know, I am an absolutely great leader. And the reason that I've gotten this far and that you've brought me here is because of my leadership skills. And you kind of stood behind and spoke about your strengths and, you know, that you are a great leader. And we see all the time and through research and through the women that we work with, they have a really hard time with self-promotion. This idea that you talk about your strengths or you, you know, ask for the opportunity because you know that you can do it, they tend to opt out or they just don't like self-promoting, so they miss out on the opportunity. Can you talk a little bit about that? That what what helped you get over and like speak with confidence and and you know conviction that you know what I am a great leader. I am not completely okay right now, but I know that I'm a great leader and that I can lead this team. Even if I'm not there 100%, uh, you know, when I'm focused, I'll be there. I'll supplement people because you knew that you were a great leader and you could lead a team. How did you, how did you get to that point where you self-promotion came almost naturally, where you built that muscle where it just came naturally? Through a lot of hard work, um, but so I am an athlete. And I learned a long time ago, I, I, I'm a triathlete. I've done 38 triathlons. I've been wow. doing my <laughs> 22nd year of triathlons. And from athletics, we learn a lot about the connection between the mind and body and things mm. like, let's say I'm out for a run and I'm just not feeling it to, to stop and almost look at the parade that's going by in your head Mm -hmm. and not stop, but just take notice of the parade that's going by and decide what you want to let keep going by you and what you want to hold on to. So Mm. I, um, I mentor usually about five young women at any given time and young Mm -hmm. ish women. And a few weeks ago, one of them was really struggling. She's a courageous entrepreneur, but she's fighting a, a, a giant uphill battle. And she, I could hear in what she was talking to me while she was asking business questions. What I really heard was her lack of confidence. She just was feeling down about herself. And I mm-hmm. said to her, I said, Whitney, I want you tomorrow morning to go When you get up in the morning, I want you to look at yourself in the bathroom mirror and I want you to say, I am a goddess on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I want you to to practice self-talk. And I don't care if you, when you go out into the world, whether you believe it or not, but I want you to project that confidence. You can go home tomorrow night and feel like a basket case, but not when you're out on the street, not when you are out running your business, mm. you feel it. And just like with sports, if we can get our minds and bodies in the same place at the same time, even temporarily, mm-hmm. you begin to retrain your mind and your mm. body, right? I'm a big believer in the mind body connection. So it's the physical strength helps feed our mental strength. So, you know, one mm. of the I encourage the women I mentor do is make sure you're exercising, right? If you want to talk about strong mind and you want to project those things, have the strength in your body, right? And without mm. getting, you know, too off on a tangent and goofy about this, we know these things are true. We yes. know that when we feel physically stronger, it helps our confidence and not losing that, right? And if everybody's incredibly busy, but 20 minutes, take that time. A, it's time for ourselves. Mm-hmm. That can be very peaceful. It's time to think or not think, but it helps to strengthen our minds. Mm. It's so powerful. I don't think people really understand the power of mindset like you said, and the visualization, but the mindset and as well as, you know, I, I, I feel like, you know, we, we have like parallel kind of like, you know, thought processes around and beliefs around the, you know, gaining courage and the, you know, needing to 
deep in, you know, reach into these alter egos sometimes that we set for ourselves, right? These power identities, these, you know, like you said, a goddess on a pedestal, what does that make you feel and evoke those like, uh, you know, those feelings of strength and emotion and confidence. And so it is extremely, extremely powerful. Um, So, Interestingly enough, like sometimes we tell these to individuals and they don't understand how it would play out in the workplace or in a day or whatnot. Can you describe for us a typical day and how you ensure like, you know, this, you know, effective execution, but in those moments where maybe you run into a situation where you have to have a difficult conversation with someone, or maybe you have a big pitch or a presentation, but take us through a day of how you would prepare to get through that and maybe tap into some of these, you know, power identities along the way to get you through there. I know it sounds cliche, but it starts the day before um, and Mm. certainly the night before with trying to go to sleep, right? None of this Mm -hmm. happens without proper sleep. But my day for me, must start with some kind of physical exercise, right? I I Mm. feel the endorphin, I'm an endorphin junkie, right? So (laughs) what I feel from those endorphins help me to start to build that confidence that I need to face each day because so many of us wake up every morning and think, okay, how am I going to face what's at me today, right? There are a million things. They all Mm -hmm. need clarity. So many of us feel that we're, our lives are out of balance. We're not doing all the things that we should be, right? I'm, right. Not, I'm behind on this. I'm not giving the proper attention to my kids, to my partner, to whatever it is. So starting the day with some endorphins helps our brain with that. Mm-hmm. But I try to decide each day whether it's just going to be a fast uh, kind of out of control, fast paced day, Mm -hmm. or whether I'm going to try to have it less fast paced, know that I'm not going to get to everything I want to get to. Mm -hmm. But a typical day for me is really spent on constant prioritization. And if I think Mm. about the things that I need to do a better job in my own life, it is prioritization so that I don't start the day right. So this morning I started the day at seven by seven 30 when I was finished with my workout, I already felt behind. I already Mm. felt half the day was gone that I was never going to (laughs) accomplish all the things that I needed to do today. And that's not a way, if I'm that way at 7.30, doesn't set me up well for the day. But I am constantly balancing between leading my real estate business, serving on the board of directors of Green Thumb. I serve on the boards of three Mm -hmm. non-for-profits. Trying to have a sense of priorities between these. So, you know, in general, these days where some of us are in our office, not in our office, a hybrid, right. uh, it's trying not to schedule back to back to back everything, right? So when mm-hmm. I look at my calendar in between 8 a.m. and 2 p.m., I have continuous Zoom calls. Mm-hmm. It, it's tough to then think that you're actually going to get anything done. Right. Um, but but the other side of that is I feel so grateful that I'm doing so many really interesting things that I'm so excited to do all of these different things. And now mm-hmm. I'm just inserting myself. These days, I also spend an enormous amount of time trying to help women in the cannabis industry get funded. Um, mm. You know, we thought with this yes. new industry that there would be no old boys network, no glass or grass ceiling, and that women would naturally have some traits that would help them lead in this industry. Mm-hmm. It's an industry where empathy really matters and often right. less afraid to lead with empathy. Uh, I was dead wrong. Um, mm. in an industry where all of the barriers exist, and I am right. not criticizing any any of the men. Um, but the fact is, we're not on the golf courses often. We're certainly not in the locker room. And we don't right. have the networks um, of people with capital. So mm-hmm. really trying to connect women to capital and to try to do things that are very obviously female forward in a positive way. So one example mm-hmm. I 
two years ago, I started an entity through which I make all my investments in the cannabis industry. Mm -hmm. and And it's called Woman Backing Women, because Mm -hmm. I want to be very clear on a cap table that I'm not, that this is a woman. And so that other women see, oh, here's a courageous person who's not afraid to do this. I, I want to either aspire or that helps to make me feel more comfortable. So mm. I'm really focused on trying to make sure that at least some part of my day each day is focused on what am I doing to help other women succeed? Because again, it goes back for me to leading a meaningful life, a purposeful Mm -hmm. life, and a joyful life. So trying to connect these things and literally maybe the most important thing I do each day is to try to keep it from being frenetic and to try to keep myself from feeling like I'm failing on every dimension. Mm. (laughs) You are phenomenal. I think all the, all the work that you're doing and the, and the purpose, like you said, you got, you really decided to embrace this idea of working with purpose and, um, and giving back. Right. And, and I love this, you're leading with empathy in all aspects of your career, which I think is really important. And I heard you share that you on any given point in time, you're mentoring, um, you know, women, five, five or so women at a time. Um, and I think that's really important in terms of, you know, everybody always seeking out mentorship and, you know, mentors and sponsors. But one of the things that I hear sometimes with, you know, young women is that they aren't really leveraging the mentorship relationship. You know, the, they may say, let's have coffee, let's have lunch or something of the sort. But what would you say are, you know, one or two things that you would, you would, tell mentees to do to, to get the most out of a mentoring relationship? Like, you know, I'm sure you coach or you take to task some of your mentees to say, okay, I'm not here just for like coffee and a, and a, you know, just a little uh, conversation. Really, how, how, how do you handle those relationships with your mentors, mentees, kind of the, the idea of reciprocity of like, you know, you giving them advice and they, they taking it or not or whatnot? Among the first things that I tell women when I begin to build these relationships is that having multiple mentors and mentors with different roles, right? Sometimes Mm -hmm. mentor relationship is one time, lunch one time or coffee one time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's monthly, sometimes it's twice a year as needed. But I tell women to be very specific in their asks to their mentors. Mm, And it doesn't need to be on day one, but this is what I hope for from this relationship because I think that expectation setting on both sides is really important. And it's important to know if the mentor is going to provide you with what you want, right? This notion of, oh, I've been paired with a mentor on its own is not enough. Mm -hmm. And then I also tell women, this isn't just about this person is my mentor, go join organizations where you can be in a room with 50 mentors, right? Where where the mentoring relationship isn't necessarily this one-on-one, but it's hearing people and meeting people and whether they're in your industry or outside of your industry, go find venues where there are going to be women that you can listen to, meet, and have the opportunity to somehow bring them or what they have to say into mm-hmm. your life. So it isn't just a the one-on-one relationship. And that's where you meet mentors. Is And it's whether it's a trade organization or a charitable organization or a women's networking group. Mm-hmm. There, go to an event where there are going to be 100 women and have 10 conversations. When you walk in the room, walk in alone know why you're there Mm -hmm. and go and meet people, go walk up to them, shake their hands or bump elbows or fist bump, whatever we're doing. (laughs) Yes. And place yourself in the middle of interesting conversations. Mm. Mentoring isn't just this one-on-one relationship, but that's where those relationships begin is in venues where people want to have interesting conversations 
and where they're open to it. So, so being very intentional when you are paired with a mentor, but on your way to finding the right mentors also. Mm. I love that. And I love how you were saying being intentional being strategic and being specific on identifying what it is they can help you, you know, help you with, right? What is the ask? What is the specificity of each relationship is going to bring something different? And I think that's important. Uh, thank you for sharing that. I mean, I could talk to you forever, but uh, I know we're having to come to a close and want to respect your time. Uh, so we're to our our traditional lightning round questions, which I love because I feel like this also shed some light on, you know, some of the, you know, some things that we may not get out of this conversation. So uh, the first question I want to ask you is what book has greatly influenced you? Wow, that's a, that, so I sit on the board of directors of the Chicago Public <laughs> Library Foundation. So <laughs> asking me to, to pick one book is like asking my favorite child, even though I have, you know, which one my favorite <laughs> I have no children. Um, uh-huh. That's such a tough one. But I think I would say there are there was a really pivotal book I read about triathlon mm. that helped me really think about this concept of the journey and the values. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I frankly, I don't even remember the title of it. But, but right now, I'm also reading a, uh, a Winston Churchill book, which mm. um, it's called Churchill and the Jews. And it's, it's just something outside of my realm, but something that in this moment in time, when we yes. think of courageous leaders, Winston Churchill was a courageous leader. Wow, that's fantastic. And you can share us the, the name of the other book, and we'll certainly add it to uh, the link on our website with the episode, so uh, that your triathlon book, so we can certainly do that. What is your favorite inspiring quote or saying? So I have so many mantras, mm-hmm. but again, today there is an Elie Wiesel quote that really resonates with me and it is for the dead and the living we must bear witness Mm, yes that is powerful especially today what is one word or moniker you would use to describe yourself curious curious yes and i think you've lived it i think your experiences show show that i love it what is one change whether it was a habit, a behavior, action that you implemented that made your life better? Um, I I used to feed my soul with food. Mm. And once I realized that I was trying to feed my soul with something that actually wasn't feeding my soul, that was game changing for me physically Mm. and mentally. That's powerful. So this is my favorite question, and let's think about, um, and we'll switch it up for you a little bit, okay? So let's say that you are um, <clears throat> you're finishing a triathlon, you know, your race, and you are fifty yards from the finish line. What is the power song that would be playing as you crossed that line? There, uh, it, that's actually a question that I have thought many times about because I. You have a run playlist. Uh-huh. I do know one or two, one, two or three songs that I want to be towards the end of the race. And I've had races where, frankly, in the last 150 yards, I didn't think that I had the strength, <laughs> mental strength more than physical strength uh-huh. to go on. There's a song by a woman named Jonathan Brook called Steady Pull. And, Mm. you know, if I think about what has to happen in those last yards, it it is a steady pull Uh that happened. So that's that's probably at the top of my list right now. Um, And then a funny old one um, by Little River Band. You know, now I'm really myself (laughs) called Cool Cool Change. And And it really talks about 
changes in our lives and being okay with change, right? We, so many of us fear change, myself included, used to. Yes. Uh-huh. It's a peaceful song about change. I love it. I love it. I'm going to have to listen uh, to Steady Pool now. I think that's a, you know, one of those things where you're, you're pulled towards the finish line. So that is fantastic. Well, Wendy, thank you so much for your time and for all of your stories and your, your vulnerability that mostly. Thank you so much for sharing that because I know it'll resonate with a lot of individuals right now who have challenges and, and hear your story and it gives them uh, the inspiration to move forward. So thank you for your time and I look forward to staying in contact. Thank you very much. It was fun to be with you today. Thank you for listening to the Beyond Barriers podcast. There are thousands of podcasts out there, and we are so grateful that you've chosen to listen to ours. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a rating and tell a friend about it and subscribe to get new episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Visit IamBeyondBarriers.com where you'll find show notes, links, and the best way to connect with our guests. See you next episode.